¿Qué tal amigos? Joel here from Spain Speaks with another podcast this week, joined again by John. How are you this week, John? I'm um, good, thanks. Everything going well? Yeah, not bad. Work is uh, good, I presume? Yeah, it's still busy, still busy. We've got lots of uh, exams going on still. That's it, it's going to be a busy yeah. few months, I presume. Yeah, until end of, well, I mean, it starts quieting down a bit in May when the uh, kids and the adults uh, start finishing their exams. But then uh, end of May, that's sort of like, you know, just goes down to a drizzle then. Uh, June, not a lot of classes. That's right, it drops off fairly quickly, unfortunately. Yep. It's not a 12-month profession. Nope. No. Now, uh, before we begin, I just want to uh, shout out to uh, a couple that got in contact with me called Paul and Sue, uh, asking if they could have a Skype chat, uh, a Skype chat about uh, some issues. Uh, I tried to reply by email, but uh, the email came back to me, so I think there might have been a problem with the uh, with the email address. So if you are watching Paul and Sue, just um, hit me up again and um, see if the email was correct. Okay. Uh, people do get in, get in contact with me, and sometimes it is hard to reply if um, if um, you know there is a mistake with the email or whatever, because they get in contact through the contact form, and maybe you know there's a typo or whatever, so yeah. uh, the message came back. So we'll see if uh, Paul and Sue are out there. Now, uh, John, this week we'll have a look at a few things. One of the uh, big things on the agenda this week, from a, from a, from a renting point of view, I, kn- I know that you rent. Yep. Uh, is that they have uh, passed a uh, a new decree, a new rental decree, which um, makes it a lot uh, easier to rent, apparently, and uh, puts the whole concept of renting in favour of the of the uh, of the tenant. Yeah, I think it's been it's been moving towards the tenant for a while now. Um, which is good and bad uh, because sometimes it gets a bit too goes a bit too far. Uh, goes through uh, the pendulum <coughs> swings too far one yeah, way. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, I I rent a house and I'm renting out a house. Uh, oh, so you're, both, so uh, you're you're in the perfect situation here. You're a landlord and a yeah. tenant at the same time. I mean, basically, we bought a house um, well outside of Madrid in a little village, um, and because of the schools uh, and a, a, f- a few things with work as well, we we needed to to get closer to Madrid, and we we came to Rivas because of the children as well. Uh, mainly because of the school and uh, being able to pick them up from school and, and everything was getting very difficult. Uh, so we, we actually rented out a house in uh, Caravaña, which is where we had the house. Uh, we rented a house here. Uh, so we've got the two situations where we're affected uh, positively and negatively by any changes they make in, yep. in these laws. But uh, you know, I, it always concerns me when um, they make it too easy for renters when it comes to leaving a property oh, and okay. things like that because mm-hmm. we've had some very bad experiences. We've had some very bad tenants who have yeah. Uh, yeah. virtually destroyed the house. Well, yeah, that's always going to be the risk. The The problem over the last few years is that um, uh, rental prices, basically they've, they've <coughs> just been pushed through, through the roof uh, due to various factors. Obviously, the most uh, well-known ones are the Airbnb effect, especially in cities like Madrid, which have enormous um, an enormous amount of tourists coming all the time here, Barcelona as well. And in fact, a lot of Spanish cities, I suppose, are affected by that, um, by, the, um, by the tourist trade when it comes to renting. And the Airbnb factor meant that it was uh, a lot more lucrative for landlords yeah. to, to do the short-term rental rather than, the, rather than long-term. Yeah, and the whole the whole idea of this is to is to uh, try to uh, bring back some affordable housing for Spanish youth uh, in order in order for them to uh, emancipate, basically, which has been very very difficult for uh, this last generation of people to do uh, yeah. to to get out of home because obviously if you have to pay if you have to compete with a tourist for a rental, yeah, uh, you're not going to win. So the uh, decree has uh, some basic uh, changes here. The uh, the uh, duration of the rental contract from three to five years automatically. Okay, seven if the landlord is a company. Prevents annual rent hikes more than the CPI. Okay, remember that um, a lot of the times landlords would come back and say that they're going to increase the price by yeah. you know anywhere yeah. from ten to twenty percent sometimes. That's ridiculous. Yeah, nothing you could nothing you could do before. And uh, there, it doesn't come into effect until. Oh, sorry, it affects contracts after March sixth, so uh, a couple of days ago. So contracts from March sixth on, 
and uh, some of the basic things are that there's going to be a price benchmark system so that you can understand more or less the uh, the general prices for an area uh, like a type of bench uh, a type of uh, benchmark system and there's also going to be a limit on the deposits john there were some mm. cases that i heard where landlords were trying to get 6 months uh, rent up front for the yeah. deposit which is pretty abusive um, yeah, I mean, again, I, uh, I've got a few different views on on the whole system. To be honest, uh, the Airbnb is a problem, uh, and I think they need to be um, changing the the laws and the way that the Airbnb is is used because uh, it, it's basically creating businesses out of private uh, houses, yeah. and I think it's wrong. Uh, that needs to be needs to be dealt with. Uh, not necessarily stopped, but, but it needs to be dealt with on a be, uh, better, in a better way. But that's this whole collaborative economy that we've got going on now. You yeah. said that it turns normal homeowners into 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 business people yeah. because they can rent. There's also a system here here now where car owners can turn their car into a business as well and take really? people to. Have you not heard of the? No. Blah blah car. Oh, blah blah car. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yep. So uh, you, for example, who goes down to Murcia, Alicante, yeah. quite a bit, you could fill your car up with yeah. three or four people, and you know, um, cover your costs or even make yeah. a little bit of a profit. So uh, obviously, there needs to be some type of regulation. That's what you're saying, yeah. right? Yeah, I think there. Uh, it, it's something that needs to be regulated, especially in big cities, because um, you know people are just turning their. Uh, their flats or buying flats mm. to to basically rent them out for Airbnb as well, uh, which obviously creates an issue for the local economy uh, and also pushes up the rent uh, of the flats and the houses around that area as well. Yeah. So that definitely needs to be looked at. But when it comes to private let, I'm very much a case of, well, if you've spent 200,000 euros, for example, buying a house or a flat, and uh, for whatever reason you've had to leave that house and go somewhere else and you're renting the flat out well I don't see why you can't ask what you want for for the rent uh, it's your property uh, you're not necessarily doing it to make a, uh, a profit uh, but just to cover costs some people do do it to make a profit I understand that but you know, if it's you've you've put out that outlay, you've spent that money. Why should you have to be restricted on what you can charge for it? People don't have to pay for it. Um, so I've got uh, I've got a, a couple of different points of view on that. Um, and I say that because uh, you see a lot of comments in the Facebook page in Reverse. Um, you know, someone's trying to rent out uh, a two bedroom. So, f- so what you're saying here is that it should be the market that. Yeah, the market the determines the price. Um, obviously, uh, if you can control a bit, uh, you know what's happening with Airbnb and that that takes out that equation, mm-hmm. um, and you can, you know, it should be the market that d- determines the price. But you get, I say, you get people uh, trying to rent out a two-bedroom flat here in Rivas, um, not necessarily in the best area in Rivas, and they're asking for seven hundred and fifty euros. Well, uh, it is expensive for a two-bedroom flat. Um, but then maybe those people have bought the flat for 160000 or something. They've had to move away. They've had to do something uh, and leave the flat. And maybe they've got a mortgage of seven hundred and fifty, but they're renting uh, somewhere else. Yeah, they and so they the need to cover the cost. Mm. So, I mean, there's different reasons why people put the price up uh, or put the price up how they want to. Mm. Uh, I, for example, um, in the house that I rent out, we put the price based on what we were paying on the mortgage to try and cover ourselves because we weren't trying to make a profit. We weren't trying to um, to turn it into a business or anything. It was literally just we needed to get out of the house. We've got to come uh, closer to Madrid for various reasons and we just wanted to make sure we weren't losing money on the house. Why? Because we couldn't sell it. <laughs> yeah, With the crisis, yeah. everything went pear-shaped yeah. um, and if we'd sold the house um, the price we would have got for the house we would have still had 60,000 more uh, euros left on the mortgage yeah you would have had negative um, equity with no house say. yeah with no house mm. so obviously it wasn't an option for us and that was the only thing we could do um, mm. so yeah I think there needs to be a little bit of common sense uh, in the whole matter um, there does need to be some sort of regulations, some sort of limits. You, you know, you don't want people ch- trying to charge a thousand euros for a two-bedroom flat. Mm. I understand that, but at the same point, you can't, you know, put a, a, yeah. real, a, a complete limit on it. Um, I think for various um, reasons. I think one of the other problems was that um, with the Airbnb uh, phenomenon, 
a lot of investment funds were buying property left, right, and center in the main Spanish yeah. cities, and and you know deliberately <coughs> targeting that market for the returns that they were going to get. I mean, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, those, those funds they need to get a certain amount of return. If they see that yeah. there is a lucrative business there, then that's what they went into. Yeah, and you hear stories now of people that are using the Airbnb system and. Um, there's no contact with the owner of these places at all. It's all automatic. You go in there, there's yeah. a code to open the door that they send you via really? a text. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There's a code to open the door. They say, if you have any problems, call this number. Uh, and it's all, it's an automatic, it, it's an automated system. You know, I mean, there's, it's not what you would be expecting, I think, yeah. in an original Airbnb that you, yeah. that you rock up to the house. The owner's there. He says, "Look, here's you know, here's yeah. here's my house here for a couple of days. Here you go. I'm gonna go. Well, I mean, you know, it's turned into a business completely. Yeah, it has. Yeah. I mean, I've never used Airbnb, so I don't really know what it's like. No. Um, was well, so, so, so somebody told me that that, that yeah. they they went to an Airbnb and that was it. They got a text message with a number to open to open the door, mm-hmm. and another number if there was any problems. Everything was there for them, and then oh, you know, leave the keys in the downstairs. So basically, it's like you go. a motel." Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, uh, well, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's one of those. Uh, I don't know whether you've ever seen the that that French chain of hotels where there's nobody working in the hotel at all. Everything is just exactly really? like that. Oh, yeah. yeah, I can't remember what it's called, but it's like the cheapest. Um, um, I can't remember what it's called. For, for, formula something. Formula One. Yeah. It's like a, the, a really cheap French chain of hotels. There's, there was a chain of hotels uh, that I saw open up in in around Spain. Uh, I thought that was Formula One or something. Yeah, it was. And it was, there form- was one over near uh, Gaddafi. Yeah, it was Formula One's. They're, they're always <coughs> in the outskirts. They're in industrial areas. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah. Uh, the yellow, yellow. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it, it belongs to the like the uh, a core group. You know, the Ibis yeah. group. Yeah, uh, and it was their cheapest one. So you, you turn up to the hotel. There was nothing there at all except vending machines and and and, and a code to open the door. And you went in. Of course, it was it was as clean as it could be. Yeah. And this is what the Airbnb phenomen- phenomenon phenomenon. Is uh, turning these places into just an, an anonymous business, basically. Yeah. You know, but this, uh, the problem with the, I mean, the Airbnb is not, it's not just a problem of uh, uh, increased rent for the neighbours, um, l- the lack of property available to rent for mm-hmm. for locals as well, but it's also the control of the people that are going in there. So you could buy a house, you could spend two hundred thousand euros on a, a lovely flat uh, in a really nice area. And then the person who lives next to you ch- turns their flat into an Airbnb. And the next thing you know, you've got people coming over on a, a, a stag do uh, for a weekend away. Right. And they're up until four o'clock in the morning, partying, drinking, and that's making all, a lot of noise. And there's nothing you can do about it. That's always going to be the risk. Yeah. Yeah, that's so, always going to be the risk. But anyway. Yeah, so uh, the uh, new rental decree. We'll see how that. Uh, we'll see how that turns out. It might be short lived because it's um, a lot of these decrees are overturned when the, if a new government comes in, which yeah. is most likely going to happen in uh, whenever the elections are in May, I think, yeah. or at the end of April, whenever they are. All right. Now we also spoke last week about some uh, touchy, touchy subjects, some taboo subjects that you shouldn't really talk about uh, when you're in Spain and. Uh, a few uh, people pointed out that you shouldn't talk about uh, Catalonia. Yep, that's. I mean, the, most of the time uh, when I've had conversations about Catalonia, um, I've spoken about it, we've discussed it, but it's never really got heated or anything. No one's ever got upset about well, it. It depends on the point of view. Exactly. Um, if, but it depends on how much you want to push it as well. Um, I'm very much a case of well you know you've got your opinion I've got mine and I'm never going to try and push my opinion on someone else so I, I sort of debate quite quite you know easy I'm easy going and uh, I don't get into arguments much with these sort of things uh, so I don't think I've ever really had an issue with Catalonia as such at all um, maybe if I was in Barcelona and discussing it with someone in uh, Barcelona that might be a different op- uh, different uh, kettle of fish but here in Madrid I certainly haven't had an issue well, I think it depends on the point of view that you had, as you said, and um, uh, which side of the fence you, uh, you're you on uh, when it comes to Catalonia. Uh, terrorism was another thing that was a bit of a taboo to talk about um, uh, previously as well. Obviously, it was a yeah. very sensitive topic here. Very much so. With, mm-hmm. with ETA, it was, um, it was something you'd, you'd sort of try to avoid discussing if possible. Um, there was a lot of lot of tension around it. Um, I mean, I, I for one, with uh, uh, the whole on the thing, the eleventh of March, 
Uh, I actually just missed that. Uh, my train left two minutes before the bomb went off. Oh, you were on the, I, was on, okay. I was in a train. Is it? Uh, That's a bit close to yeah, home. I knew nothing about it until because uh, at that time it was in 2004. Um, when we left the train station, just a few minutes after leaving the train station, you basically lost your yeah, mobile yeah, signal. Yeah. Um, and we're all sitting there completely silent on the train. And mm. then all of a sudden, all the phones rang on the train all at the same time. It was like it was something out of a film, you know. Yeah. Uh, for, really that, for, for those people that don't know, that was the 11th of March, 2004. I think it was it? 2004, if I remember. The, the Atocha train bombing. 2003. 2003, 2004. I can't remember yeah. which. I think it was 2004 because yeah, there was so. an elec- there was an election that year as yeah, well. I think that's it. That was the Atocha train bombings. I think 197 people died. It was nearly 200. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was Atocha, El Pozo, uh, around Santo Eugenio and that as well. It was, uh, it was quite nasty. Sp- Spain had a history of terrorism before that, and yeah. uh, you know, living here during that time, there were there was you know somebody was getting killed or a car was getting blown up every week. Yeah. You know, it was it normally was aimed at politicians, where Wadi Civil, politicians, police, uh, army. Military. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, you know, it affected a lot of people. It was horrible uh, scenarios. Yeah. You know, bombs going off, and obviously civilians got hurt as well. And yeah, that no, yeah. wasn't yeah. nice. Uh, Dystopian says uh, avoid uh, talking to Spaniards about Franco religion, football, and he'd also include <laughs> bullfighting. Uh, religion, yeah, I, I, that's a topic you should probably avoid uh, everywhere um, <laughs> religion is one of those topics that uh, people can get a bit touchy about it as well especially with what's happening now in the in yeah. the Catholic Church around the world you know you don't yeah, want to really bring that topic up again religion if, if you talk about it sensibly it doesn't become an issue it's when someone goes to the extreme yeah but, but it always tends to go to the extreme it's it, it's one of those things that it's difficult to have a uh, uh, you know, a, a peaceful conversation about religion. Depends on how, what you're debating, I think. Um, most of the time when I talk about a religion, it's, it's a case, well, there's normally, for example, uh, I actually had a conversation about religion just uh, three days ago. I, I used to work... With, with a Spanish person? Yep. Uh, I worked for a year um, as a teaching assistant in a Catholic school. Um, and it was a, a contadado. So a was, it, was it an Opus Day school? What? Opus Day. Yeah. Okay. Um, very religious. Uh, well, you can't get much more no. extreme than that, can no, you? No, exactly. And uh, basically, the I knew it was a Catholic school when I went in there. I didn't realize quite how extreme some of the teachers were going to be. Um, so I the knew big, there was the going to be the restrictions. Cross, the big crosses everywhere. Oh, didn't? virgins everywhere. <laughs> yeah, uh, in, the, in the classroom, there's virgins staring at you from the yeah. corner. But um, I didn't realize sort of uh, how much I would be restricted on what I could talk about. So my first experience was was with uh, um, Halloween. Uh, Couldn't discuss Halloween. No, Uh, that's taboo, Halloween. Taboo, Taboo, but I was expected to teach about the British culture as well, uh, where where I'm from and what we celebrate and what we do. But then I couldn't uh, talk about Halloween. And okay, so Halloween is not necessarily a British uh, holiday. It's something that's been... Um, uh, taken from America and from well the original uh, place where it was celebrated was Ireland mm. uh, so you know yeah okay it's been it's been adapted but people like it and it's celebrated a lot in England now and we well, celebrate uh, we a lot a, here as well yeah it is now it's, mm. it's growing a lot so of course I was a bit I was like oh it doesn't make a lot of sense I'm not going to tell them oh this is what you know we're going to all the religious side of things it was just basically what we celebrate and why we do it sort of thing um, so I had a presentation, everything prepared. I got told, "Oh no, you can't do that." So I was like, "Okay." But then, uh, every year on the fifth of November, uh, we have a celebration in the UK called Guy Fawkes Night, um, but we're also known as Bonfire Night. Uh, basically, that is uh, a celebration um, which comes from a bit of a weird uh, beginning, really. Uh, I think it was 1705, if I remember rightly, there was uh, a, a terrorist attack, if you like, uh, attempt uh, on the Parliament uh, buildings in, in London. Uh, and basically, a guy called Guy Fawke, he was, he was caught with, I don't know how many barrels of gunpowder underneath the uh, Houses of Parliament, uh, basically trying to blow up the government. Um, it, was a, it was a conspiracy between a lot of people, but he was the one caught with the gunpowder underneath the uh, underneath the building so basically at the time it was um, 
people celebrated the fact that it didn't happen uh, by uh, doing the same bonfires and and then a little bit further down the line it got more extreme and actually made uh, sort of like uh, dolls of Guy Fawkes uh, with old clothes and uh, leaves and things and then burning an effigy of him on the on the bonfire and something um, but over the years I mean the reason why we celebrate Guy Fawkes night sort of disappeared it was just yeah. a good fun uh, festival yeah you have to go to Wikipedia to find out the origins of exactly that, I think. but uh, <laughs> I got told I couldn't I couldn't tell them about that either I was like I know so I was like, I, I, I said to him, I don't, why? So you were censored, John. Yeah, I was You censored. were censored by the church. Like, What's going on? Freedom of speech. Um, but I, was, I asked why. Why Why couldn't I expl- uh, explain that? Because it's actual, It's a very British holiday. We don't have that many fiestas in the UK, really. No, you've only got, yeah. uh, we've only got a handful. Um, and that was one of them, you know. And it was not actually a public holiday. It's a celebration, but it's no public holiday. Mm. Um, but I got told that basically Guy Fawkes was Catholic and he was going to blow up people so I couldn't talk about it oh, he was, he was a Catholic, Catholic terrorist yeah okay. so I was giving Catholics right. a bad name so yeah I was um, I had a I enjoyed my time at the school and a lot of the teachers were very nice and everything but I saw one of the teachers who was a uh, teacher of religion yeah. uh, at the school you were, uh, seen I saw as, him. you were seen as the Protestant rebel yeah there we go um, I saw him the other day uh, just a few days ago and uh, he's a lovely guy um, but I had a little chat with him about uh, religion there and it's, it's all you know he knows how I feel he knows I'm not religious at all yeah. um, and uh, he made a sort of like little remark at one point of uh, you know if God uh, lets me sort of thing you know, uh, looking at me with a smile on his face knew it, knowing that you know I, I didn't feel the same way so it's, it, I think it all depends on how you take it and how you debate it and, well of course yeah. and things and I had yeah. the discussion at the school as well I mean I spoke to a few people at the school and they asked me oh we, uh, you know so you're not Catholic sort of thing I'm like no I don't believe in anything in particular really mm. you know um, mm. and they were quite happy, they, were, they were quite good with it they didn't try and push it on me I think it starts getting heated and starts getting uncomfortable and more of a taboo subject when someone wants you to believe what they believe so I would never turn around to you and say you shouldn't believe in God he doesn't exist yeah um, so when you when you criticise the faith like exactly so, yeah, yeah. I mean, you just don't do that and you know you have to respect other people's beliefs and if they yeah, do, yeah, other right. people want to believe in a God or uh, another being then well that's well that's why always, not? well that's that's always going to be the issue yes. I mean uh, you know you would you wouldn't be putting on a Ricky Gervais um, no. <laughs> uh, comedy special at that school where, no, he's, where uh, he, he's probably the most um, atheist uh, the, the person who's most of an athe- atheist that I've seen for a long time yeah that's right but it's his point of view he gets it out there exactly. he probably has a lot of uh, people wanting to take him down but uh, you know yeah. freedom of speech over everything else I think well, I find uh, religion quite interesting as well. Uh, I actually enjoy talking about other yeah. religions. Well, it's a fascinating topic if oh, you think about it. It is. It's amazing. And, um, and especially when you start learning about religions that you don't know an awful lot about why they celebrate certain things, why they believe in certain gods, what these gods actually are and what they do. I don't need to believe in it. Um, but I need to know that the person I'm talking to does believe in it, mm. not to disrespect their beliefs. And just listen and learn about it uh, I mean being a member of a cricket club is fantastic for that mm. you learn about Islam about um, I mean the the Muslims in uh, the club have told me things about uh, their faith and and then you've got people that are celebrating Ramadan and they explain why and what it is and, and I think it's fantastic uh, I, I would never you know I, I would never tell someone oh you're, you're wrong yeah, probably, I mean, probably what, who's wrong? No one, no one knows who's right or wrong. And there might not be any god. There might be loads of gods. No one really knows. There's pro- no proof. Pro- probably more difficult to explain uh, leg before wicket, John. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. And uh, some other cricket rules. Uh, yeah, <laughs> instead of religion. Uh, yeah, he also mentions here bullfighting. Bullfighting is one of those topics which is also a bit divisive at the moment because Spain's going through a quite a strong uh, animal rights. Um, uh, let's say the a lot of animal rights groups are getting a are getting a, a, a big voice now in the in the population. In fact, I think they were talking about banning hunting in one of the in one of the regions really? last week in, in Castilleon. Yeah, oh, I think they I were talking about that. that. Bullfighting's been prohibited in uh, Catalonia. Yeah. In Rivas, we don't have bullfighting. No. They banned it twenty years ago, I think. Yeah, it was uh, a long time ago. Yeah. So, uh, and it is one of those uh, topics that uh, can also be a bit divisive, especially if you are anti. Taurino, as they say, if yeah. you are anti bullfighting here, be careful who you talk to. 
But uh, I wouldn't bring that up. I wouldn't, uh, unless you're very, you know, you're looking for a fight. Uh, bullfighting can still be a bit of a problem. Yeah, that's a bit of a touchy subject. Uh, it is. It is. Who's talking to. Uh, in fact, my um, myself, and my wife don't uh, like bullfighting at all. Uh, at all isn't we'd never been to one we wouldn't watch it i think it's uh, cruel and a bit nasty i don't like it at all but we've got for example my my sister-in-law is married to a bullfighter oh really so what what do we do we just don't mention bullfighting we get uh, have family get-togethers he's got you know when we go to the house they've got uh, pictures of his bullfights him in his uh, 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 outfit and everything so so this is your wife's sister my wife's sister, yeah, my she's sister-in-law. Married, she's married, married to, to a, a bullfighter. bullfighter. Yeah. Okay. So he does it. He does it as a um, he, he, he a was, hobby. Or he was he was uh, part work, so it's kind of like part time bullfighter, if you like. Um, and then he he drives a taxi as well. Okay. Uh, so you know, because it, it, to, mm. to become a a professional bullfighter is not an easy thing. Uh, it takes no, a right. I think a lot of uh, enchufes. Yeah, a lot I of think, contacts. Uh, a lot that's of contacts. It, yeah. Uh, and also, well, it's a big a industry. Well. It's, it's a big, big industry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it moves a lot of money. Every yeah. every town in Spain has a, well, not, not everyone obviously, because I just said that Rivas doesn't have bullfighting, but uh, the majority of places have bullfighting. Uh, obviously not like the big spectacle that you see on the television, but they, you know, they have a little bullfighting ring, and you know, the the you know the mm. the people in the in the in the the town fiestas, you know, yeah. they they love to go and and see a bullfight. There are some other uh, atrocities, in my opinion, regarding bulls. The ones where they stick, you know, like oh, the, the fire on the they stick horns, fire on the horns, things, yeah. and the bulls are trying to, you know stick their head in the sand to put the fire out i mean that's just barbaric obviously mm. those things i think have to change but i'm not going to go there and protest obviously because mm. uh obviously uh, you know sometimes you have to sort of oh, i don't know what the word is but um, you know if you don't want to but this is another fight. another thing that we mentioned uh, a few weeks back mm. um <laughs> i don't like bullfighting I don't, I don't like it at all. Uh, it just doesn't interest me at all. I, don't, I think it's very cruel. Um, it's not nice at all. But I would never protest about it here in Spain because it's I'm not Spanish and I'm. Well, I still feel, even after 21 years, that I'm a guest here in Spain. Uh, despite, Respect some of those traditions. Yeah, despite paying taxes, I'm you know I've, uh, and everything else, I've become a uh, fully active uh, member of uh, the Spanish. Uh, population and yep. everything but it's a tr Spanish tradition and why should I be able to come to an, a country that's not my country of birth mm. and then complain about their traditions yeah. it's not for me to do so well, I don't I don't do that I um I had a, a conversation with a student of mine uh, a few years ago now he was uh, he was uh, he's a, a, a pretty important guy in business circles here in Madrid and he told me that um, if you're not Spanish, you can't have an opinion on bulls or bullfighting in Spain because it's such a part of his and the Spanish culture that if you're not born with it, you can't have yeah. an opinion. No, I don't necessarily no, agree with I that. I disagree with that. You can have an opinion. But that, uh, but, but that's that radical yeah. bullfighting yeah. pro-bull side. Yeah. And then you've got the other side, which is also radical, and they just clash you know, yeah. constantly. Well, of course you can have an opinion. Everyone can have an opinion on anything. Mm. Uh, the difference is, is whether you act on your opinions or not. And there is a group of people here that are against a lot of these traditional Spanish things yeah. you know like and bullfighting is on the agenda yeah. i mean there's a political party here podemos of course you know if they yeah. if they could they change half yeah, of the things of that are you know traditional to spain and that's yeah. what really pisses off that other side of the population yeah. that's more traditional you know but at the end of the day it's um it's, a, it's again you, i don't think you can defend any sort of action where animals because are it's killed a tradition or? uh if the Spanish people want bullfighting, um, then really it's basically up to the Spanish people if they keep bullfighting or not. But you shouldn't be uh, defending bullfighting on the premise that it's a tradition. Okay. Because I mean, they don't they don't have gladiators and slaves fighting each other in Rome yeah. because it was a tradition back then. Yeah, they don't. It, it doesn't continue. That's what you exactly. Say. Yeah. I mean, uh, people evolve, countries evolve. Yeah. Um, societies evolve. Societies evolve, and yeah, you, know, you become mean, more civilized yeah. and things. And you, you know, look, there's you, things you, that don't need to continue, but you, that's you, up to the Spanish to decide. And you, I'm you not. look at you look at things a different way. Mm. 
And, um, you know, it is one of those things, and that, that's what I think they're trying to get that, that message across, that, you know, that uh, perhaps, you know, I think that the Roman reference was quite a good one there, that, you know, some traditions maybe are, you know, not for, not for modern day. I have mm. no idea. I'm not going to go into the topic now. No. But, but, but there were other traditions in Spain where animals were badly treated. There was one where a goat was thrown off the top of a church. Did was you it a goat or a donkey? I think I, I think it was a goat. Was there was okay. probably another um, yeah, thing involving a donkey. donkey. Yeah. There was a tradition <coughs> in the Basque country where they used to hang the uh, goose. Sorry, the goose. Yeah, they used to hang a goose and jump on it until its neck snapped. Yeah, until they pulled its head off. Basically. Now I, I don't know who the first person to to think of that was, but I, don't know. It's I mean, barbaric. Is it? Why on earth would you do that? It's well, again, I'm not going to go into Basque tradition, yeah. but but if you if you've got nothing else to do, that you decide to stick a live goose because yeah. it was it, it, it was, was alive. It yeah. was alive. I think they still do it now, but it's a dead goose now. Is it, well, I think they've changed it for a plastic goose or something. Was it? Oh, I, don't, I thought, I don't know I thought they done. continued. Uh, well, I mean, I haven't looked at it for a long time. Um, Oh, what was the name of the town that did it? Was it uh, begin with L up in the north? Uh, Le, Le Caidio. Was it Le Caidio? Uh, probably. I don't know. It was Le Caidio. Um, but yeah, I think I, I went to Le Caidio. Uh, oh, you went if, I, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, do apologise if I'm not. Um, I went there for a wedding uh, probably 10, 12 years ago. During, uh, that, during that festival? No, 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 no. Uh, but I learned about it when I went there. Um, um, uh, I learned about the, the, this, the tradition they had. And I, I understood that uh, they, they still used a goose, but it was, um, it was already dead. Okay. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I don't know. Well, but you know. Me. I mean, that, that's one of the things I do. I look at and I think, oh, my God, why would you do that? But Lecadio, again, Lecadio, I think, Lecadio, is the yeah. place. Yeah, 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 yeah. So... Uh, yeah, what's well, yeah? I mean, there's pictures of it here. If you want to go online and put that in, if you put in Los Gansos Lecate, or you can see that you can see the event and see what they do. But again, it's tradition, it's tradition. And people, um, you know, when the animal activists go to these places to protest, which they do, I yeah, mean, you do. know, there's a lot of tension in the air. Yeah. You know, the Guadalajara Civil has trouble sometimes to control the yeah. the groups of people, <laughs> and they, they come to blows. Yeah, the other thing he mentions here, John, is football now. Um, I know that you're a football fan. Yep. Uh, you're a big uh, Tottenham Hotspurs fan. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, have you uh, got a Spanish team? No. no. Uh, but this, that's something I don't. I don't get that. I don't. I mean, I can understand people following a Spanish team because they've moved to Spain and they live in that area, and it's you know they go to watch them and stuff. But I'm a Spurs fan. I was brought up as a Tottenham Hotspur fan. Yeah. My dad was a Tottenham Hotspurs fan. He was. Um, uh, Tottenham Hotspur were his local, uh, was his local team when uh, when he was growing up in North London, and and that's how I was I was brought up. I was brought up. Yeah, really so it's in, it's in your blood. It's in my blood. So, okay. Um, and people always ask me, especially my students, the, the the kids more than anything else. So what's your football team? So I tell them, like, yeah, but what's your Spanish team? I, like, I haven't got one. Mm. How can you not have one? I'm like, I don't have one. But do you like Madrid or Atletico? It's like yeah. I don't have one. Yeah, they, they just don't seem to understand that. So, well, in other words, obviously you come from a place where uh, uh, football or soccer, as we call it in Australia, is is it's it's the main sport. So you've got your team already consolidated. Yeah, I, I can't get into uh, Spanish soccer. I mean, I, I watch the important games, but I don't come from uh, a football, a soccer background. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Australian rules was the sport that I played when I was young. Cricket is in the summertime, and I've I've never been able to get in. My family, yeah. my girlfriend's a mad Atletico de Madrid supporter, and I went to games. So every yeah. every weekend we used to go to the games there in the old Vicente Calderón. But I, I can't get into the into the into the feel of football here. But it is also very political. Yeah, I think that's where we've got a big difference here in Spain compared to back home because I've never noticed any political involvement in sport in so, general. In so the there's UK. no, there's no. So when che well, let's say for example the the big teams in the year, well, Chelsea's big now, but they 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 weren't twenty years ago. So let's say um, I don't know some rivalries. Let's say for example Liverpool. We got Liverpool, Manchester United. Man for United's example. a big game. Um, you know. 
you, but there's it's, no uh, politics no, involved. It's not, no, it's, not. It's, it's more just uh, local rivalry or rivalry in general yeah. because they've always been competing. You've for got the, the city rivalry now, the city yeah. Man U rivalry. Yeah, of course, that's okay. always been a rivalry. You've got but now a City a bigger team. You've probably got your London rivalries with well, your Arsenal's and your Tottenham's. Yeah, probably Arsenal Spurs probably one of the oldest and biggest uh, derbies, uh, okay. local derbies in in history because really. it's North London. Is it's it? North London. Now, you, you used to be able to go to the top of White Hart Lane. Uh, um, and if you looked uh, from the top of the stadium, White Lane, you could see you Highbury, could see which was the old uh, Arsenal stadium. They're that close, you know. They're just a, a short distance away, so you could actually see it from there. But now, obviously, uh, the Emirates is the new stadium, uh, Arsenal, and yeah, things have changed a little bit now. But the, the rivalry is still there. A very yeah. big rivalry it's between not, the two. It's, it's not as um, you can't you can't feel it like you could before. Uh, no, I've, I've, the rivalry is still big. It's no, but I mean huge, in, but in, in, the, in, the, in the neighbourhoods. No, it, no, in the neighbourhood you still got it. Oh, you do? Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, my family is a perfect example. Uh, <laughs> we've got half my family are Spurs and half of them are Arsenal. All oh, right. Because they're all from, uh, all my dad's side of the family from North London. So all my, uh, my dad, his brother and a few of his cousins are all Spurs. And then uh, his other cousins and uh, my... Uh, my granddad's cousin basically you got all that parts Arsenal so it's like Arsenal one side Spurs the other you go to a family party uh, I remember once I think it was my cousin's 21st we went to uh, his party on, on a Saturday which happened to be after the North London derby unfortunately Spurs lost I think um, yeah and that was all, it's always a lot of banter and but it's, it always used to be fairly uh, healthy you know not really any problems uh, probably a few more problems uh, nowadays with uh, people sort of pushing people to the limit on social media and things yeah, as well. Yeah. Well, but that's well, that's not that, too much really. That, that, that's a big problem that's uh, crept in now. That's right. Yeah. There was the, there was a movie. One of my favourite movies was um, uh, a movie called Fever Pitch. Fever Pitch. Did you ever see it? <laughs> I think I probably saw it years ago. I can't it was about remember. an Arsenal fan who was—he's yeah. was like a crazy. I think it was a Nick Hornsby, um, a Nick Horn, Horn, Hornby, Hornby, Hornsby, Hornby. I think his name is. Novel of a crazy uh, um, Arsenal fan. Yeah. And basically, yeah. the life in his neighbourhood just evolved around football. Yeah. You know, and that's the same thing here to some extent. But when it comes to a Barcelona Madrid. You know that, that the 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 politics for me is just it's just you know you it's, you can you can cut it with a knife you know yeah it's too much politics in uh, right. in football here I think uh, yeah. it's unfortunate but but the I mean, the uh, well, football between those two yeah, teams yeah between those two that's right yeah. yeah but I mean the the football's good here um, I, I find the Liga a little bit boring uh, for me because uh, it's always the same uh, sort of two three teams up the top and it's always I mean. I think probably more than anything else, it's not the football. Uh, the football's not boring, but it's more the the news. You, you look at the paper, you look at the TV, teams. and they only ever talk about Real Madrid and Barcelona. And then a little bit a of Atletico. Side, yeah, as a side thing, they start talking about Atletico. Maybe if Sevilla or Valencia are in the top four, maybe they'll get mentioned a bit more. But it's always the same, the same players, the same teams. Always yeah, you'll never, and Madrid, and it gets boring. You'll, you'll never hear about a lot of the other teams. And also the amount of uh, media time that they dedicate to to football here I mean crazy. It, it, I, I don't know what it's like in the UK but here they've got this like every station has a radio program that goes for three hours in the evening about football mm. starting yeah. at 12 o'clock yeah. you've got the two main newspapers here in Spain As and Marca yeah. or Marca and As I should say because Marca is the biggest one solely dedicated to football yeah well, they they do they talk about other sports well, as well, yeah, but, but I mean, a little bit the, 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 the last page. Mm. But Madrid, uh, Atletico, Barca, obviously yeah. the Catalonia, they have a paper as well that's only dedicated to football. So it uh, you know people uh, eat people uh, eat um, eat um, eat sleep and whatever you know football. football. <laughs> Yeah, but it's uh, eat, sleep, and breathe. I think is it's the, the expression news that football. gets me. It's the, news. the news, and uh, maybe I mean, for example, you got you got um, news on, in the UK six o'clock. Six o'clock news. That's the one I always used to watch when mm. I was uh, back in the UK. Six o'clock news. Six o'clock till half past six. It would be the news. news. Um, and then for the last sort of uh, well, maybe the next five minutes, it would be the sport. So talk about f uh, sport for five minutes. Then it'd be the weather, two minutes. And then uh, the following six or seven minutes, they'd have local news. 
So it actually, um, uh, the transmission will go to your local news station. Uh, and then back to your normal program, so 45 minutes or something like that. Here, I mean, you can watch the, the, the news for sort of 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and the next thing you know, you've got half an hour of Well, on the weekends especially, yeah. Like, on the oh weekends you're doing, that's right. Yeah, yeah. or the build-up to it as well. Um, yeah, I no, it's, it's that, enormous. That's... And when there, when there is a, a Madrid-Barca game, uh, the the media starts three days before showing oh, showing the before. showing the old games yeah. and ah, it's just unbelievable. But anyway, yeah. now the final topic. We'll move on. Final topic was uh, schools. We had a comment here from uh, I think a Mexican um, a Mexican bloke here. I'll just check the comment exactly. So he's planning to move to Spain uh, and he wants to know about uh, public uh, cooperative uh, schools. They called. Um, Cooperativa. Contratados. Oh, contratados, that's right, yeah. Uh, and private schools, he said his kids are nine and four, um, both, and they'll be coming uh, from the US, but they're Mexican nationals. So uh, on this topic here, we've only got a few minutes left, but on this topic, we could talk about it in a bit more detail next week, but El Mundo, uh, one of the newspapers here, John, recently, I think last week, uh, put out its annual list of the best schools in Spain, mm. Los Cien Mejores Colegios de España. And uh, it's got a list of uh, the best schools in Spain. It's got uh, private ones, it's got the concertado ones, uh, as on we said what? before. Based on what? I have no idea. Uh, whether it's a religious school, whether it's a, a non-religious school, and... Uh, you can sort by province, you can sort by um, or, or the country as a whole, and you can see it's just got a, uh, um, a, a score. So we'll have a look and see what the criteria is here. So I'll just go to Madrid quickly. Let me have a look here. We'll go to Madrid. So we can see that the best schools in Spain here, it's only private and concertado. There's no okay, public schools No public here. schools in well, they, maybe they didn't make the list. I have no idea. But the best school in uh, in Madrid is one called Estudio, and the criteria was the teaching model, uh, the offer, the educational offer that the school has, uh -huh. and the the the, the material, the like the what's it called? The uh, it says here los medios materiales. Oh, so yeah, so uh, the. Uh what the classrooms yeah, are like, probably. What, basically, what uh, what they have or not uh, available to the students. That's it. Yeah. Okay, that that's the criteria here for the for the selection. So, okay, that's fine. And you can get an idea. So this score here, for example, private, as I said before, it tells you the um, the the type of school. So it's private. Uh, it's not religious. It's mixed. Um, um, what's it called? Uh, boys and girls. Okay. Mixed okay. School. Mixed school. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, uh, the number of students going to the school, uh, nearly nearly 2,000, 1,868. Number of teachers, 185, so you can work yeah. out the teacher-student so ratio. Are they high, Are these high schools or any school? Well, uh, it, it doesn't really, it says it says here what it has here. I think that it says that it goes through from uh, pre-primary all the okay. way through to, it gives you that that idea as well. But I think a lot of the private schools have that yeah. in place, that they start at pre-primary and go all the way through. That's right, yeah. And you can see the languages that they offer, the services that they have, et cetera, and the price. So the best school in Madrid, it says here, the price is from uh, 477 euros, which is the cheapest price per, per month. Per month. And the most expensive uh, price for this school is 750 per month. So if you want to get the, like the bus route. It's not, as more, it's not expensive as I expected, actually. I thought it was going to well, be compared to Australia, this is this is dirt cheap. In Australia, yeah, I, I think say. private school in Perth, where I come from, is going to set you back. I Five, don't know, six anything. thousand a uh, month, uh, trimester. Uh, yeah. 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 Say, where this is going to set you back, you know, 750 times nine, whatever that is, is yeah. you know, it's going to be the price. So probably you're going to be paying what you pay per term. Yeah. Per year here, maybe more or less. Yeah, because yeah, I think uh, back back in England, a lot of the uh, private uh, private schools, uh, called public, uh, a lot of the schools. Uh, I mean, I think they're in between five six thousand pounds a, a um, term. A term. I yeah, think. yeah. Uh, so here it's a here it's a bit cheaper. So here you're going to be looking at about you know around two thousand two thousand two maximum. So that's going to include yeah. your your lunch at the school every day in the school canteen. 
uh, your uh, bus route and probably some after school activities as well in that 750 or they could be extra I don't know but that's more or less the price so I'll, I'll leave that uh, in the in the description below if you're interested so you can see that um, you know th those are the best schools in Spain there's no public schools here for whatever reason I don't know whether it's because and well, it's, it's not true if the private ones are offering uh, a lot more languages and they've got the money to buy more well, materials. That, it, I it, think it, I it's all about the resources. Yeah, it's the all resources about the aren't resources. available in the public that's schools. It, that's it. Uh, not that the education uh, is necessarily bad no. in a public school, but the resources, yeah. of course, because the 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 private school that we have, not the one here in Rivas, but there's another one in a place called Loeches. You, you see the installations that they've got. I mean, uh, they've got a you know they've got a a, a full size athletics uh, yeah. track. You know, they've got tennis courts. They've got indoor swimming pool outdoor swimming pool i mean you can't the public schools can't compete with that no. obviously i don't I think find it weird anywhere. Though, because i had that in the uk in my school, at a public my school. School. Oh, really? it was a, uh, a normal public school well, 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 we had our own athletics maybe. track 10 uh we had 10 grass 10 maybe concrete yeah. uh yeah, tennis well, courts the luck of the luck of where you're born i suppose yeah, yeah. i suppose well, i mean we had a lot of the high schools in the uk used to have uh really good uh, facilities well the public ones in australia have good yeah. facility for sport they have they have yeah. a, they have a, a football ground a cricket ground yeah. or the same it's like a mixed ground that they use for both sports maybe yeah. you get a tennis court netball court basketball court etc but uh private schools are here are the only places that you're going to get that but anyway yeah. now got to finish been going for over 45 minutes today so we'll wrap it up john thanks for okay. your participation again no problem uh we didn't get through everything that we wanted to speak <laughs> about today we could have we could be going forever on this podcast but we'll cut it short there we don't want to have it too long but we'll be back we'll be back next week questions or comments please leave them in the section below give the video a thumbs up if you liked it download the podcast on apple itunes spotify google podcast whichever podcast platform you are on download the platform we'll see you next week hasta luego Thank you.